thing ever, right? The greatest technology ever. We knew that over 20 years ago, there's other persons that have been in the field longer than I have. What's been missing is a good business model to show that one, the technology can solve real business problems, and two, the technology can make money for investors. And so the data that we collect is for investors primarily. And when we use the term investor, we use it in a broad sense. Um, investors as far as private capital markets, but also strategic investors inside of large global enterprises, as well as government agencies that can spend anywhere from tens of millions to hundreds of millions of dollars in new technologies. So before they spend that money, they want to understand what's the real problem that is solving? What's the return on investment? How do I make money? Those types of questions that are always asked in capital markets. Now, governments are asking those same questions. And that's where our focus is. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, right? Yeah, this, this is, I think this is the catchphrase of the COVID era. You're on mute. Uh, so <laughs> I think it happens like at least to me, maybe twice a day you know, at this stage. But uh, yeah, just to, to get in on our, our, our topic, um, uh, to, to see where, where we can actually get into this, uh, part, of, part of the power of AI is, is that it's able to do so much in, 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 a, in a very narrow area. Okay, we don't have this general purpose AI yet, um, but we have we have access to to very powerful AI techniques uh, which have high degree of accuracy in relation to very narrow niche areas. For example, like looking at mammographic images, you know, um, from from medical data specifically. But, but, but image recognition is something that machines can do really really well. But there is risk associated with it. approval of the AI before we can actually bring it out into the marketplace and, and expose it to our citizens? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of folks are thinking about certain high risk um, instances of, uh, of AI and, and, you know, advocating or at least considering the idea that pre-market approval should be a part of that. Um, and, you know, again, we have that for, you know, drugs, for example, in the United States mm -hmm. and other countries where you have, um, you know, the safety profile of a drug, uh, the efficacy of a drug, and then the clinical impact of a drug being assessed. And, you know, I think that it would be completely fair in some future state uh, to, to do that with artificial intelligence in high risk situations where you'd be evaluating, you know, the safety first. I think that should always come first, <laughs> then the efficacy. Um, and then, you know, how does it actually work in clinical practice? And I think, you know, as a as a creator of AI, we've had to do that uh, without that sort of structure. And, you know, it's been fraught with uh, challenges, I would say. I mean, we've always prioritized safety first. So I think, you know, we feel good about that um, and, you know, have efficacy data. But I think, you know, it's not without its challenges. And I think that a lot of folks are not necessarily prioritizing, um, you know, lack group fairness, for example. Um, and so I would be an advocate for doing something in the area of at least um, having some measures that you are required to show before, um, you know, before, you know, entering the market. So, but we're far, far from that at this point, unfortunately. And I think, you know, one of the things that makes hiring tools a little bit more complicated is that often, um, instead of regulating the technology itself, you're regulating the use of the technology by an employer, because both things are actually important, right? If you think about it, like if a drug is safe, but the hospital administers it incorrectly, it's not the drug maker's fault, right? So it's it's complicated because, you know, the, the purveyor of the technology is not the one who is then ultimately using it um, on folks. And, and that's where things can go wrong as well. So it's a complicated area, but definitely regulatory changes, I think, are coming and, and much needed. So... Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think there's a huge need there for sort of standardization. Uh, and I mean, standards tend to be the, the, as I say, yeah. the benchmark or, not, or the, the, the foundation of a lot of this work. Yeah. If you've got standards, you've got certification, regulation, yeah. and legislation. But do you think, is there a need for like some sort of a self self-regulation, like in, in terms of labeling the types of AI that you're bringing to market? Or, yeah, I, mean, I, I think 
there's limitations to self-regulation. Um, I think you really need to have, you know, enforcement um, through government agencies. Um, I, I just think self-regulation just ends up not being effective enough. That's, you know, my opinion. It may not be a popular opinion among technologists, but that's how I think you really need to have some some external regulation in place. Yeah, I think we're going to have to make some hard choices like as time goes on. And and to take that to a, to maybe to an a more extreme level, um, is I'll just I'll put a question out to you. Like, so if we have this, you know, fear factor or, or, or risk associated with AI in the wild, like particularly when it's citizen focused or citizen centric, um, are we going to end up with like sort of either you know AI doing a lot of good or or, or AI going wild? Like, so this utopian versus dystopian future with, with AI. Do you want to pick up that point and and, and discuss? maybe yeah um i think one of the the most pernicious parts of ai and why i think doing sort of as street is saying a kind of environmental impact report but a societal impact report for ai is so important is that when you deploy ai systems at scale to the general public it's not like the general public doesn't change you're actually changing the substrate because it's happening at a cultural level of the public itself so you know an example is the pretty simplistic AI recommendation engine that YouTube has, um, right? It's it's not a super advanced system, and yet it's discovered the adversarial attack against the human mind, which is if you already believe one conspiracy theory, serving you more is very effective and pulls you in, right? And so in the U.S., uh, the rise of anti-vax, pandemic, these kinds of conspiracy theories deeply aided and abetted by Facebook and YouTube sort of recommendation systems. AI changes the cultural substrate. It's not easy. You can't just walk that back. That takes incredible amounts of work to try to convince mm. a public now to, to take a vaccine, um, mm. which helps everything else out. And so that's why it's not enough to just let companies self-regulate or to um, deploy systems and then see how they affect the world, you really have to get in front of them because they're growing from a society which it then is modifying in real time. Um, I think one of the most confusing parts about the time we live in now is that we live in a simultaneous utopia and dystopia. You know, we can hit a button and have a car show up in like a minute and a half and take us where we need to go and that's magic. Um, and also we see the complete erosion of our ability to believe in fact and have the substrate in which democracy grows. Um, we live in simultaneous utopian dystopia and the biggest problem we're going to need to solve sort of goes back to an E.O. Wilson quote, which is the problem that humanity faces that we have paleolithic emotions, medieval instincts, and increasingly godlike technology. <laughs> and we as human beings, our brains aren't really changing. They're sort of constant. And yet the software that they're operating within, like the, the ecosystem, they're getting better and better and better at hacking us all the time. Think of it as like accelerated human hackability, or if you want an acronym, ah. Um, and, uh, you know, starting really, in, this is, you know, Yuval Harari's point, um, but starting really at the end of the you know, 18th century, we switched where we place um, sort of the, the, the keys to agency, like where does a democracy run from? Where do governments run from? It used to be outside of us, right? It used to be like Bibles or it used to be monarchies. And then it shifted to being within us. The voter is always right, right? the knows best. The customer is always right. Um, trust your feeling, trust your heart. Um, especially, uh, you know, post FDR, we started getting to Reagan. Um, we saw the rise of the focus group and, and Clinton, honestly, in the US, the rise of the focus group being the place by which uh, policy is being set. It's it's not like somebody sitting out there deciding what's best for your country. It's polling. So, in that situation, though, is it? And is it not a case that we that, like we need to both do do both? We need to manage expectations because people said in the nineteen fifties that oh AI we've sorted it, brilliant, and we're going to have this 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 general intelligence like next week, and that's like fifty years over fifty years ago now. And on the other side, then we have this uh, situation with, with deep fakes, and uh, uh, you know that, uh, and we have this fear factor associated with, with, with AI as well. So. That's the the other part of it, like you know, where you have Skynet and you have you know you have loss of jobs, like billions and billions of jobs going to be lost, like you know, because AI will take over. So I think yeah. there's just two, two aspects to that. I, I I agree, and I think the part where like the AI takes over, um, AGI, the singularity, what that all misses is that there's sort of two points, right? There's the place when technology surpasses the things we're best at, 
And that's coming closer, but still a ways off. And then there's the part where technology surpasses our vulnerabilities, um, the, the things that we're weakest at. And technology has already done that, right? Like we all suffer from tech addiction. We all suffer from information overload. Um, deep fakes is just another way that like a limitation of the human meat suit is getting overridden where all of a sudden we can't tell whether an image is generated or not. And, you know, that's been true with Photoshop for a while, but at scale, that's not been true where you can be an entire city full of generated people and none of them are true. And we've, we're yeah. moving from a world of the uncanny valley into the synthetic valley where the air itself is persuasive. Um, and since we put the keys to, you know, governance, et cetera, in the minds of single humans, the hopes and desires of single humans, now that those are hackable at scale, you know, that's the, like, on what basis are we governing? That's the philosophical bankruptcy that we're entering into that we need to solve. Yeah, look, I, 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 yeah, I also picked up on something you just said there where you mentioned the word emotion. I'm going to come back to that now after a while. But I want to bring Ed back in again, because with all of this sort of, uh, extreme ends to to AI, like uh, but on the good and bad, good and bad sides of the spectrum. Uh, and I want to just get you talking maybe about as AI, AI is a contributor to economic growth. Okay, because you've got you know a wealth of experience there, like you know, and, and in relation to uh, how uh, you know in, in the normal, shall we say, everyday run of, you know, run of the mill business, international trade on a day to day basis, AI can contribute contribute to GDP. Absolutely. So, so a lot of times we talk about these exponential threats and exponential risk. It's, it's a lot of science fiction. So if you've had hands-on experience with the technology, you understand it's limited capability. The average AI today, which is some of the best, has the brain power of a seven or eight-year-old. So if you think your seven or eight-year-old can take over the world, then be in fear of AI, right? However, with that being said, the biggest threat that we have today is around the data that's supplied in order to feed the artificial intelligence in order to make it smart. So when we talk about governance, government governance is primarily around uh, data security and data privacy. So how do you use my data in order to um, help me uh, raise me out of poverty, for example? And I'll give you a firm example. 10 years ago, we worked with the World Economic Forum as well as the Gates Foundation, who was an impact investor. They went from philanthropy to impact investing. We piloted a project in sub-Saharan Africa where we use um, biometric AI for registration for immunization purposes so that we can track immunizations of uh, mothers and newborns because research led to the conclusion that the biggest risk to a child's mortality is between birth and five years old. So we looked at what interventions could we take in order to help that mortality rate, mortality rate rather. And AI was used in order to collect biometric data so that we can track that immunization throughout that child's first five years of life, as well as that mother. So that's an example, it was done in a good sense. Hmm. Some countries have decided, well, now we're in the, the era of COVID. We did this over 10 years ago. So how can we learn from those lessons, but also make it more inclusive, where we actually have participation from um, the individuals that are using the technology? And so that's where we see the biggest opportunity is to have that education, where, where we have that level of inclusion, where everyone feels like they're involved in making decisions and their data is being used from a personal standpoint um, to better um, help them grow, whether it's their own uh, out of poverty or their economic growth or their personal wealth or whatever their goal may happen to be. Uh, another example, I asked my, uh, I did a very unscientific poll. I have two kids, I asked them both. They're both um, in tweens. And I said, can you trust AI? And they both said to me, no. Okay, so I asked my son, why not? He said, because it's hyped up in sci-fi. He loves sci-fi. So he's looking at movies and they're like, wow, this is, looks really scary. And my daughter said, I, I don't think I can trust AIs because the people that develop AI. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? Well, some of the people 
don't seem as though that they're ethical in the way that they handle personal information, right? Mm -hmm. There's some ethical concerns there. So if, and also there's not enough diversity and inclusion. It's not enough people that look like me, Mm -hmm. right? That you're one of the few African Americans that's been a pioneer in the AI space, right? There's even fewer women. So people that don't look like me, people don't look like you are making decisions. So I'll give you an example. Over 20 years ago, I was on the product design team and we designed fraud detection algorithms. So on the internet, one of the first. We also uh, developed other algorithms around credit and making financial decisions. I was the only person of color in the room. So unintentionally, there was bias in the system from design. And in certain senses now, the whole uh, economic uh, scene has changed just through COVID and even before, uh, where credit worthiness is, is different, right? So if, you, if you're cash rich, you're credit poor. What, what's wrong with that? If, if you've had financial bumps over the last six or eight months, but you've been your history shows you've been 20 years, you know, paying on time, you can't get a credit card. So those algorithms from 20 years ago are outdated. But majority of the financial institutions that use these algorithms have been using them for the last 20 years, and they have not been retrained with new data and then including diverse and and inclusive people in designing those. So yeah, that, that's a big problem, like with, with AI. Like I mean, and this and this comes under the heading of, of trust. Obviously, like you know that we have situations like where at the end of the day, it's it's humans that are are building the systems. Like and they they're bringing their own prejudices and their own biases to to their programming. And then you, depending on the data sets, I mean, you get every we've all heard of this garbage in, garbage out. Like if, in, when it comes to the data analytics, so if we don't get good data. Then you don't have good analytics. So in, you're, 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 you're spot on there. But to bring back more, because a lot of, a lot of what you said, like, and uh, really interesting. And by the way, you've got some, so you've got two good, insightful kids there. I mean, I have to say as well. <laughs> yeah, getting back to the infrastructure, because you were talking about sub, sub-Saharan Africa as well. Like, and infrastructure is something that, 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 that uh, contributes a lot to this, but we're getting way off topic then when we're talking about trust. And I want to get back to Frida and, and just bring trust back into the room because we're, the, we, we have to use these systems if we want to improve our lot. I, I, I mean, and I've written papers previously uh, about how AI can help uh, with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Mm-hmm. But from but from a medical point of view, like we still have this risk associated with you know mm-hmm. trying to use use AI for for good, like in, in terms mm-hmm. of even medical. Like, and, and do you want to pick up on that point again? I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's going to just make similar points that I made earlier, which is I just think we need a lot more transparency around particularly the outcomes of these algorithms, right? I think it's potentially less important to know every single, um, you know, aspect of the code or, you know, all of, you know, sort of the, the, again, a car, what do you want to know about a car? You want to know its gas mileage, you want to know whether it's going to kill someone. You don't really need to know the details of the engine. And I think AI is, you know, in many cases, the same way. I want to know the impact that it's having um, on, you know, aspects that I care about, basically. So I think it's, you know, and again, it becomes complicated because AI can become very multi-layered. You may be using multiple AI systems. How are they interacting with each other? You know, um, you know, some, uh, so there are lots of complications, but at the end of the day, I think we would, we would learn so much as a society if we just had much better transparency and reporting on important outcomes that these algorithms have. And I think, you know, like in the United States, there's the Algorithmic Accountability Act um, that's being considered, um, and it would require reporting to the FTC on things like disparate impact group fairness, right? If we knew a lot more about how these algorithms were performing um, in finance, in housing, in hiring, in all sorts of areas, um, I think that would be, we'd be living in a much different world, right? So again, I'm broken record, but I think transparency and reporting are critical. No, not a broken record because it, it, it's 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 core. It, 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 we can escape it. Transparency. You cannot have trust without transparency, and it, that's just the way yeah. it is. So, yeah. the, and we need to hammer home that because people are not getting it. Yeah, so we need to hammer home that fo- point over and over again until people start believing. Yeah, and, and I- then- 
evolve and start actually. Other, other things you could be transparent about. Um, you could also interrogate your data sets um, if, if it's as easy as that to look for proxy variables, for example. I mean, that would be another one, you know, and if you see data sets that have very strong proxy variables with, you know, protected characteristics, that could be a problem as well, right? That could be another area. Um, I just think people mix things up sometimes. I mean, in the sense that if we throw everything at the wall and say we want to report on, you know, 31 different things, not all of those 31 different things are going to be as important. And I think the public gets somewhat confused um, and you know, rightly so when, you know, the media report on, oh, well, there's you know all these different types of biases. And if we don't do this and if we don't do that, and then people start to feel like, wow, this is just an intractable problem. And I think it just then, um, you know, it, that plus the whataboutism that's rampant in our society leaves us to think that um, there's no solution and then we're sort of paralyzed and hopeless, right? And I think that that's not the right approach. I think there are solutions and I think we have to focus on um, what's really important in terms of what we need to know about um, Which, and, and misinformation, uh, you know, fake news or whatever associated with AI, uh, as, as well as the fact of what AI can do, you know, you know but, but the concept as well. And in terms of transparency, in some instances, like if you're dealing with deep neural networks as well, it's just not possible to be able to. And the citizen doesn't want to know what's happening at layer five, layer six, because the, the designer right. doesn't exactly. even know. You know, so we're we're gone we're gone to a stage where where that's gone off the, gone off the um the, the radar as well, um, but but there's still some cool stuff, and, and I want to go back to Asa and his emotion because there's this, this is something that he, he brought up the last time we spoke, and also uh, he mentioned it in in the out the his, at the outset there. So AI and emotions, Asa, come on, impress us. Mm. Yeah, um, so I just want to. I wish we could replace, I'll, I'll answer that in a second, but I wish we could replace every time we talk about behavioral data or data in general, because it's such an abstract thought in people's mind. What is data? Where did data hurt you in your body? And like, it didn't hurt me anywhere. Um, with history of decisions, because when you understand they're collecting the history of decisions, your history of all of your decisions, all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, given that history of decisions, it's actually really easy to understand what kind of decisions I'm going to make in the future and what I might do to make you make a different decision, i.e. start to take over some of your agency. Um, and I think that just emotionally connects a lot better. And then you're like, oh, well, what does Google and Facebook know about me? Well, like if you, they're, they're buying uh, your geolocation data, they're buying um, your purchase history, connecting it back to you as an individual, to everything you've looked at. So they know like if you're having an affair, what diseases you have, what drugs you are taking, um, whether you take illegal drugs, um, uh, whether you're getting depressed, when you got depressed, like this list, I can just keep going down. That's an incredible asymmetric amount of power. And when somebody has an asymmetric amount of power over you, well, in uh, when you have working with therapists or doctors, um, uh, these are people that have an asymmetric power and asymmetric knowledge over you, know the information about you that can be used to exploit you. They're beholden to a fiduciary duty to you. They are required to act with duty of care towards you in your best. Yeah, it's an ethical standard. Exactly. And this is what we yeah, have. If we're going to trust yeah. any of this new AI stuff, we need to know that these companies, anyone that has this asymmetric amount of power over us, has to act with some kind of fiduciary interest, and that has to be up at the like protection regulation perspective. Well, well part of that is how who's giving the people the power. I mean, Facebook, mm. I was in the intelligence side of AI, that's how it started out, right? So working with government agencies, um, a number of acronyms that I don't need to name right now, we used to look at different strategies around intelligence gathering. Facebook came around, people give away, tell everything, right? So it's a certain amount, we talk about fiduciary responsibility, but it's also a certain level of personal responsibility too, right? So it's not just a government fiduciary, governing, governance, and regulation, but there's also some personal responsibility not to tell the world your personal business if you don't want it on the internet, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I that there's some amount of personal responsibility always required. However, it's sort of like um, in climate change, 
uh, industry telling individuals that they just need to use less plastic change bottles and fly less, yeah. change less. <laughs> yeah. And it's a form of, of gaslighting. And the same yeah. thing is true here. What's inhumane is that we are all forced to use systems that we need that are fundamentally unsafe, mm. right? For many people, they can't leave Instagram or Facebook because that's so they have their livelihood and stay in contact with the people that they love. Um, it's this bundling, which is unethical. Yeah, I think that there has to be some sort of, of Hippocratic oath, oath that has to be taken, you know, that you have to minimally uh, uh, sign up to do no harm. You know, with AI, at least, like you know, that 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 there's a certain level of safety and there's a certain level of mitigation of risk. I think Frida, you were going to jump in on that. Well, no, I, I was just going to say that I think it's also the monopolistic power a lot of these platforms, right? Because if you had choice, I mean, so for example, I don't use Facebook anymore um, because I was able to cut off Facebook, and that really didn't impact my life too much. Um, but Google, I find harder to get rid of because <laughs> because of Google search and other things like that, or Gmail, yeah. for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, although I did switch to Firefox, right? So all I'm trying to say is I think they have such monopolistic power over certain aspects of our lives, right? Um, that I think it's really hard, you know, to yeah. your point um, that you were making in terms of, Ed, in terms of personal uh, responsibility. I mean, I agree with you. I, I can leave, I can leave Facebook with no consequence, but to Ace's point, you know, many people get Wi-Fi through, they get internet connectivity through Facebook in developing countries, right? So they're, you know, unless they want to cut off that, they're not able to leave Facebook. So it's complicated, but I do think that the monopolistic power um, is definitely a problem, so. Absolutely. And, and it's harder to trust, you know, in, the, in those situations as well, like where we get these super large companies, that these 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 uh, mega mega companies, uh, who you just buy off other companies as well. So that one uh, one week you're using, for example, WhatsApp, like which is secure end to end communication, and then the next week it's owned by Facebook. You know, so you, you just it's, it's very difficult. I mean, I I'm like yourself. Like, I mean, I've left some of those comp those 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 uh, applications as well. So I don't use WhatsApp now. I've moved to Signal because at least Signal doesn't store your data. You have control of your own data, whereas yep. Certain other vendors, they don't. They have access to your data, and they can, they can do whatever they like with it. So there is that risk associated with allowing um, AI to process that data. Like, and this is as as exabytes, actually bigger, like a yacht of bytes of information that is, that is available to to the likes of Google and Facebook, you know, and and uh, we're abdicating, I think, our own responsibility. I mean, to, to mean, there's a couple of people yeah. that have to. Lots of, yeah, lots of, lots of people that are working towards this at the moment. I know Interrupt yeah. and, and uh, their company, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, like, is involved in that. Like, and he's trying to remake the web so that you have control yeah. over your own personal data. Yeah. So that's uh, interesting. Yeah. And, I also, and I also think, I'm mean, not to bash too much on these big companies, but I also just think that like, you know, we're relatively sophisticated. We know what they're doing. But you, know, you see ads on you know, TV. You know, like Facebook cares so much about your privacy. Or you know, um, ads on a podcast saying, like, you know, and it's just, just a lot of... I mean, to Ace's point, there's a lot of gaslighting and sort of ethics washing that's happening. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the average consumer, I'm not trying to make them sound not smart, but, you know, they're not necessarily going to have as much time to investigate whether these companies really are or are not, um, you know, holding up to, you know, their ethical standards. So I think there's a, obviously it, it's a purposeful obfuscation on their part of what they're doing. And I think, you know, it, it's unfortunately working in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. So I just ask you a question, and 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 this this is not on our script at all, but it's just come out of what we've uh, what, what we've actually been discussing anyway. So, it, um, so it may not have been something that we've we've we've, we've spoken the out in, in, as as we introduced ourselves and our backgrounds, etc. Um, but AI has capacity to do great good and potentially great evil as well. So I'm going to say, look, if if you look at say for example the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, it got it's got three basic. Uh, um, groupings like so you have economical uh, you have environmental and you have societal so with, with putting our, our our context here which is risk you know an ai uh you see has been ai been good you know you're not too much risk associated in some societal good environment good economic good or do you, where would you where would you put ai in 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 that context in 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 the united nations sustainable development goals uh, context uh, anybody can jump in there. Uh, well, hey, you I would, I would put AI in the category as the, one of the biggest accelerators of economic growth that we've seen in the 21st century. Now, with that being said, it's a, it matters how we use it and what biz, what the business model is behind it. For example, with Velocity AI, 
we're working with customers in um, the energy space. They're looking at monetized data for various reasons. Um, but we also have built in economic incentives that part of that uh, revenue that's generated from that data is then reinvested back in those communities where the data is being collected. Um, so it's different business models that we can uh, look at economic impact and growth, not just for the big tech companies, but uh, but for everyone. I leave the same point to you, Asa. Uh, uh, um, I think we're going to see a never-ending stream of examples where AI makes the world better. We'll be able to point to them, and it'll be profound and it'll be real. At the same time, when you zoom out, I think what we're going to see is that AI, because the quality of your algorithm is dependent most on the scale of your data, that we're going to see a accelerating sort of success goes to the successful. We'll see an increasing inequality in power um, from it, which mm -hmm. will result in an increasing inequality of, um, of, of wealth. And so we're going to have some much bigger problems to face because of the exponential accelerating nature. Um, not all that wealth will be distributed equally. Um, I just, I wanted to, to jump back for it's a second to, hours. To, um, to the emotion side, because we often get stuck in these conversations about data, but it's not always just own your data that's, that's necessary. So imagine you're Google. Um, you have access to Gmail, all of the emails you've written, and who's responded to them and how you respond back. So like all the emails that you responded positively to or quickly to, and there's a new technology called style transfer. You use it for like uh, taking like a Chagall painting and making your portrait in style of Chagall, but you can do this with text too. You can take somebody's text and learn to write in their style and transfer it. So Google now has the ability without ever selling your data to build a model that learns left their servers. This is just about pure unadulterated power. By the way, we don't have the antibodies to deal with an environment that becomes increasingly persuasive. So this is sort of like the direction I think we need to look at. I think empathy is both incredible and beautiful and a fundamental human experience and also the biggest backdoor into the human mind. Uh, Microsoft's chatbot, um, Jawize, 20, deployed to 660 million people. 25% of their users have said, I love you to the bot. Um, loneliness, you know, growing epidemic um, is going to be the largest uh, national security hole that we've ever had. Um, when we say, can we trust AI? It's these things we need to have in our mind um, because just looking at the individual like deployments won't get you to understanding this, like the, the larger systems uh, that are about to change. Mm -hmm. But is it going to say something that I think is interesting? Again, I think it's back to the business model is a little bit the issue, right? Because let's say you were using that persuadable language to, uh, I don't know, convert people uh, who think the other side of the political aisle are horrible, right? And you can speak to them in a way that made them think that, I don't know, like Democrats think that Republicans were wonderful and the other way around, right? Um, but there's no business model in that right now, right? Uh, but there's a business model in selling you underwear, I don't know, <laughs> or whatever you're looking for. So at the end of the day, it's just back to, you know, like, it's not the technology that's the issue. It's how we're using it's, you know, again, it's just how we're using it, what the what the incentive structure is for the use of the technology. And again, I'm not saying we have a fix for the business model. That's way more complicated. I'm just saying, um, I think that at its core is, is potentially a bigger problem. But uh, well, and one of the things I really appreciate about what you're doing, Frida, is that you are articulating and then holding to a set of values. Um, and those values are constraints. In some ways, they tie your hand behind your back compared to a competitor that isn't doing that. Um, right. And then in this sort of exponential race to the bottom, it's whoever can out-compete wins unless you have regulation, unless you have protections. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of the point. Like values constrain, that's the point mm -hmm. of them. So yep. if we want to have values in these uh, pernicious and massive deployments of AI, we yep. need to have protections, otherwise competition is going to yeah, and an interesting one, like because even in all this situation, like where where there's this you know sort of fear factor etc. associated with AI, we have 
a survey was done recently, like, you know, and asked, you know, just general, the general public, um, who would, would they use AI or, or do they use AI? And I think 35%, I'm just coming from memory anyway, but it may not be you know, 100% accurate, but about 35% said, you know, that they, they use AI or they would use AI. And uh, in actual fact, 68% uh, of people actually do use AI. And the reason being, they have it in their pocket. The smartphone like, is, has so much AI in it now, and it's much more powerful than, than, than computers that landed the man on the moon. But this, this, this is where people don't... Once, once you've achieved a certain amount with technology, people take it as being you know, commonplace, no longer smart. You know, that it, it's just, a, it, it's everything. Like, it's like electric light was magic at one stage, you know, but now it's 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 just, you know, it's electricity. I have a question in, in from the audience here. I'm just going to pull this up from uh, Edel Calver. Um, I've got a couple of questions, actually, but I think I, I, I see Alan Paul has been asking questions all day, so he's probably a bit tired. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I'll take Edel Calver's que uh, question, and it's about... Uh, is he used GDPR, okay, so the General Data Protection uh, Regulation, as flawed as it is, is it a small step in the right path, or is it just giving companies more time, even at the risk of uh, potential minuscule fines? Um, so, uh, so I'll just make I'll make a statement on this myself first while you guys are thinking about it. Uh, and this is the last question, and then I'm going to do a, a wrap up around around just. Uh, we we'll go around each of the speakers like for, for a wrap up, a takeaway a comment. So in relation to GDPR, uh, I think GDPR is quite good, and it's one of the better things that's come out of the EU in, in a long time in terms of looking after privacy and data and protection of, of individual data and individuals' data. Um, I personally, because I come from a standards background, I would have preferred that there was a standard first, then certification, then regulation, and then legislation, because that's the, a more stable environment to build rather than starting with regulation and then trying to create standards, because uh, standards are in national anyway and GDPR then becomes very, becomes regional as it was uh, coming out of Europe and then we're looking it's been adopted okay uh, in, in various countries after that but from my point of view uh, I think that uh, what it, it has it's doing good uh, it wouldn't have been the approach that, that I would well at the end at the end may justify the means and uh, it wouldn't be the approach I would have taken I would have come went to standards route first and then looked at regulating the market um, uh, and then legislating for breaches in in, in, uh, uh, in regulations. Uh, but I'm going to try and open to you guys in relation. So Adele's comment is, is GDPR as far as it is a small step in the right direction? Anybody? I believe, I believe it's, a, it's, it's a good step. It's a step that's better than no step, right? So I'm, I'm all with you, Ray, that the sense that you create standards and then you go down the, the gamut. We just didn't have that luxury um, because of looking at the um, growth that these AI technology has created, especially for the big tech companies. Uh, but definitely. Yeah. I Okay. And is that same? Noddy? Yeah. Right. Well, then, with that said, thanks for the question anyway, Adele. Um, and uh, we, we're already over time. But I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of our panelists, um, uh, Frida and Ed and Eza, to uh, do a takeaway. So we're talking about risk associated with AI. So what's your takeaway comment, you know, that would sort of you'd like the audience to, to go, with, go away with as a, as a as a, a sort of a little nugget, a slow burner to think about um, um, uh, after the session is over. Is, I'll start. Um, we'll talk, start with you, Frida. Yeah, I'll start. I think actually Asa's comment was really poignant in the sense that, you know, if you have um, sort of ethical values or you've said values, it does constrain things. And then, you know, and that could put a platform at a disadvantage in terms of growth. And therefore, that's sort of why we need to then ultimately constrain um, all platforms to that same, you know, uh, sort of standards. And actually, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I sort of thought about that before, but that's my takeaway. Thank you very much. Over to you, Ed. Business model. In order to make artificial intelligence a sustainable investment, there has to be a clear business model for investors, for all stakeholders, especially when we look at the term stakeholder capitalism. It has to be incentive for everyone involved. And Eza. Actually, Ed, I really liked your your sort of analogy to like imagine AI being a seven year old, um, and uh, the reason why I'm like one, who better manipulates your emotions than a seven year old, right? Um, right? They they don't go through your cognitive front door; they go through your emotive back door. Um, and then <laughs> two, imagine how persuasive they would be if they could then go spend time with your therapist and uh, 
everyone that you've ever talked to and they're just sort of hanging around like all the like they pick up swear words they pick up a lot they're super i mean they're not cognitively they don't have a development but they know a lot now imagine that seven-year-old making decisions about whether you're going to get um a loan whether you're going to go back to jail who gets the predictive policing thrown at them who um is serving up your uh your next youtube videos and you're like is that the world we want to live in no we have to constrain those multitude of seven-year-olds because otherwise they're going to do whatever's at the base of their amygdala and drag the rest of humanity into it yeah and as my takeaway is that we're going to have this these disruptions we have emerging technology we have something new around the corner every other week it, it's cloud computing it's big data it's ai it's smart cities it's digital it's quantum it's 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 green you know every every other week we have something new and these emerging technologies are going to create disruption with disruption you get chaos for a while Okay, for a while, eventually you get standardization and we quell all that chaos. And it's all part of the innovation cycle. So we get internationalization uh, and then we get more research and development and then we get disruption all over again, but it's something new. So it's a, it's a good time to be involved in, in information technology. And I want to thank each and one, each and every one of my guests. Uh, I want to thank Frida Poli, uh, CEO and co-founder of Pymetrics. I want to thank Ed Sewell, who's the CEO and founder of Velocity AI. And last but not least, I want to thank Asa Ruskin, who's the co-founder of the Center for Human Technology. And uh, with that, I'm just saying goodbye. My name is Ray Walsh. I'm the executive director of DSF Inter International. It's been my pleasure to host this uh, exciting panel. And, uh, and we would be way over time, but we will keep going for the rest of the evening. Uh, this is just an, such an interesting topic. But before we, we, we say goodbye, just uh, a quick wave and uh, say adios to all our, our viewers. Thank you very much. Thank you. For everyone. Bye.